Yo, what is up, A Push people? We have period six covering 1865 to 1898 in 10 minutes for you today. Everything you need to know about period six, please make sure you are checking out the description for more review videos, including periods one through five and then period six through nine covering things that are specifically mentioned in the new curriculum. Before we begin, it's shout out time. Shout out to Mr. Schmidt's class at Baldwin Park High School. Your students think you are the greatest teacher in the world. Mrs. Pyle's class at Indian Creek High School. Your students love you. And Mr. Fitz's class in Texas. They think you are awesome. And I cannot believe how many people in Texas watch my video. So shout out to you if you're in Texas. Thank you so much. All right, let's begin starting off talking about the Gilded Age. This term appears multiple times in the new curriculum. What exactly is it? Well, it's coined by Mark Twain. And what it means is that things appeared to be good on the surface when you looked at the United States socially, economically, and politically, but underneath there were social, economic, and political issues. So it appeared as if everything was good, but once you dug a little bit deeper, you would see that there were issues. During this time, government subsidies fueled westward expansion, especially for railroads. And we see the emergence of monopolies. And the purpose of this is for businesses to gain power and resources and businesses began to look beyond the north american borders the american borders for markets especially overseas towards asia social darwinism was an idea used during this time by wealthy to defend their success and it's the idea of the survival of the fittest that if you are rich and wealthy you deserve to be and if you are poor you just need to work harder and during this time we see a growing gap between the rich and the poor and what is called conspicuous consumption for the wealthy, the idea that they would spend money on gaudy things, spend lots of money on, on things that they wanted to own. All right, let's talk about the workforce. The expansion of the workforce leads to more farmers moving to cities for jobs. We see a slow shift and more farmers are quitting the farm life and moving to the cities. And in 1920, in period seven, we'll see more people are living in cities than on farms. This would lead to lower wages and also an increase in child labor. So unions emerged during this time, and the purpose of them is to seek better working conditions and wages. Two unions you should be familiar with. The first we have are the Knights of Labor, and they are made up of skilled and unskilled workers. And they ultimately do not last long due to the Haymarket Square riot in the late 1800s. And then we have the American Federation of Labor, led by this guy, Samuel Gompers, also known as the AFL, and they only allowed skilled workers. They were much more successful. The New South is this idea that people thought the South should become industrialized and bringing industrialization to the South. And although this did happen in some areas, sharecropping and tenant farming still persisted in the South. So even though there was this idea of the New South, sharecropping and tenant farming still existed in much of the South. All right, let's talk about battle over natural resources and land. And this is between corporations and conservationists. So you really see the beginning of environmental movements. An example of this is the Sierra Club, which sought to preserve many areas of the environment. Farmers during this time are going to have struggles, and they sought to limit the effects of mechanized farming or machine farming, which displaced a lot of farmers, and dependence on railroads. So they form organizations such as the Grange, which is an organization of farmers, and they sought to regulate railroads and grain warehouses where their goods would be stored, and they are not as successful as they hoped to be. So we have the emergence of the Populist Party, and they wanted to increase government control of railroads, telegraphs, etc. And the main figure of the Populist Party is this dude, William Jennings Bryan, who runs for election in 1896. Now there's also the Omaha platform, which called for the election of senators, income tax, regulation of railroads, and also the introduction of silver in addition to just the gold standard. Many of these ideas were later adapted during the progressive era, which we'll talk about in, in the next video in period seven. Some ideas included the income tax, the direct election of senators, and the secret ballot, or the Australian ballot as well. All right, let's jump on over to urbanization. So we have new immigrants, and these are people coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, places like Italy and Poland. And they said it tended to settle in cities and boomtown areas of the West. They were heavily discriminated against by organizations such as the American Protective Agency, or the APA, which was heavily anti-Catholic, very similar to the Know Nothing Party prior to the Civil War. Characteristics of cities during this time included divisions among ethnic, racial, and economic lines, and immigrants tended to settle in the same area. So you see the merchants of, play, of things like Little Italy and Chinatowns developing, so immigrants tended to live in ethnic communities. 
Cities provided jobs and factories to large numbers of women, immigrants, and African Americans. So African Americans are beginning to move from the South to the North. And we see the emergence of political machines, most notably Tammany Hall in New York City. And this dude, Boss Tweed. And what they did was provide social services in exchange for political support. Also, settlement houses are founded, most notably Jane Addams Hall House, and they helped immigrants and women transition to an urban life. Let's talk about the impact of the transcontinental railroad. So when we're talking about westward settlement post-Civil War, many people are migrating out west due to the hope of economic opportunities and also government policies, whether it is the Homestead Act that provided land like for this family or subsidies to railroads, the government played an active role in encouraging westward migration. As a result of this, treaties with natives were often violated and violence and conflict occurred between settlers, natives, and Mexican Americans as a result of expansion, especially with natives as the U.S. expanded west. And remember, there is no clear description in the Constitution with how to interact with Native Americans. So the government's response to Native resistance was conflict. And we see lots of military force, including Chief Joseph, who tried to flee and he finally gave up and said, my heart is heavy. No longer will I fight. Custer's last stand, which was when the Natives killed General Custer and all his men. And this picture here, the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890, which is essentially the last battle between the U.S. military and Natives, in which hundreds of Native Americans, most notably, especially women and children, were killed. And Natives were also placed onto small reservations, and the hope was to end tribal identities. And Natives identities were also changed through assimilation most notably the Dawes Act they did things like cut Native Americans hair and, cool, and many of them were forced onto small areas of land to farm All right Gilded Age politics they focused on economic issues during this time including tariffs remember Republicans want to raise tariffs Democrats want to see tariffs go down Republicans raise tar Democrats down the gold versus silver issue the 16 to 1 ratio that William Jennings Bryan was talking about and much of the government during this time focused on laissez-faire policies or not getting involved in the economy government corruption called for many in the public to seek reform whether it was on the local state or national levels including things like the initiative referendum and recall which would become popular in period seven under the progressive era the interstate commerce act was established to regulate railroads although it was more symbolic at first and we see an increase in nativism and racism during this time through things like Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the Supreme Court upheld Jim Crow laws and said separate facilities are okay as long as they are equal. That is specifically mentioned in the new curriculum. I have a detailed video on that. And the Chinese Exclusion Act as well is another example of nativism or racism during this time, which banned Chinese in 1883 from emigrating to the United States. And also, as we talked about earlier, the APA or the American Protective Association. Finally, we'll finish up with intellectual movements. There are way, what were the ways that the wealthy justified their approaches and wealth? Well, you have the gospel of wealth, which was written by this dude, Andrew Carnegie, and he urged that the wealthy should donate their money to better society, and he gave lots of money to libraries throughout the United States. Social Darwinism, which we talked about earlier, Herbert Spencer, that dude with the really sweet sideburns, he applied Darwin's theory of evolution to humans and argued for survival of the fittest, and he said that the rich deserve to be rich, and this was a very prominent theory during this time. The social gospel was a Protestant church movement that sought to improve cities and the lives of the poor, and this really helped influence the progressive era. And women and African Americans during this time period, you begin to see them challenge their quote place unquote economically, politically, and socially. They begin to really speak out during this time. You have people like Booker T. Washington, who encouraged vocational training for African Americans, Ida B. Wells, who was an outspoken critic of lynching in the South, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who advocated women's suffrage. All right, let's do a quick recap for period six. Definitely know the reasons for the emergence of monopolies, what is social Darwinism, and especially, and especially know that the rich used it to justify their position. Reasons for migration to cities, why were people moving to cities? What is the New South, and was that really an accurate term during this time? What is new Im immigration? Where did these new immigrants settle, and what were characteristics of them? Labor unions specifically know that the AFL is made up of unskilled workers and the knights were made up of skilled and unskilled. The Grange was a way for farmers to try to better their situation, as was the Populist Party. Although the Populist Party was not successful by electing a candidate, many of their ideas came to fruition 
in the progressive era, westward expansion, what were reasons for it, and what was its impact upon natives, and be able to identify a couple battles. And Plessy versus Ferguson established separate but equal, which will be overturned later by Brown versus the Board of Education. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the section below. And please make sure you check out my other videos, especially the massive review videos I have that cover the entire curriculum. And um, I look forward to seeing you right back here for period seven in 10 minutes when we'll take a look at this, the great migration from the south to the north. And most importantly, best of luck to you in May when you take the exam. I thank you very much for watching and have a good day.